So, we meet once again. Now we've got some interesting questions lined up here, so I want to get straight to the point. Welcome to a Caspian Report Q&A. My name is Shirvan. By the way, in our previous Q&A episode, some were asking how to get one of these shirts. We've got a Teespring shop set up. The link for it will be in the description. If you want one of these shirts with the Caspian Report logo, head on over there and pick one of your choosing. The quality is pretty good and if you use the promo code CASPIAN5 you'll get a 10% discount that's only temporarily available. But enough with all this, let's get started, here we go. Question number one by George, how likely is it that war will now break out between the USA and Iran? And what options does Iran have to minimize its likelihood or mitigate its outcomes. At this point, the details of what exactly transpired are beyond the point. Trump is trying to coerce his Iranian counterpart to the negotiating table and draft a new nuclear plan that includes more geopolitical considerations and not just restricted to the technicalities of nuclear bombs. Whereas in the past Washington applied economic pressure, now it is using military to reach a deal. Besides, two years ago we witnessed a similar narrative on North Korea. Remember the fire and fury speech? And the consequent escalating tensions? Remember how it felt as if Washington and Pyongyang were on the verge of war? Well, we are seeing the same ruse again in Iran. It's a means of pressure. But let's assume somehow Tehran and Washington come to blows. What are Iran's options? Because that is the second part of the larger question. The United States can certainly destroy the Iranian military, but that would not mark the end of the hostilities. To have any chance of ending the fight, the United States would have to invade and occupy Iran. Now, we've seen the extent of Iran's asymmetric capabilities in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, now imagine the force the Iranians can bring to bear on their own soil. Tehran's conventional military is nothing to boast about, but none in the Middle East can match its militant proxy prowess. But that's not all. The American occupation of Iran would offer Russia a new form of leverage in its strained relationship with the United States. These are all tried and true policies in the geopolitical handbook. We can take comfort in the fact that the risk of war is momentarily way too high for both parties, so therefore it's unlikely to occur. Next question by Stephen Reeves. Do you think populists, nationalists in Europe and America will have success in the next round of elections? Right now, in Europe, voters across 28 member states will vote for the next European Parliament. 512 million people will be represented by 751 seats. Since the traditional parties have thus far failed to give voters a better alternative, nationalist and populist forces will continue to gather strength. The populist parties are likely to make sizable gains this election, so much so that they stand a good chance of taking over the majority in the European Parliament, thereby unseating the pro-EU coalition of the centre-left and centre-right. But on the other hand, we can also assume that many things are bound to go unexpectedly different. For one, the parliament is the only democratically elected governing body of the European Union, and it has final say over topics like migration policy, trade regulations, budget, distribution, all sensitive topics. While in the past the populist forces wanted to simply end the system, now they want to govern the EU to harness its legal powers. Still, winning seats is not enough, it's never that simple. The populist and nationalist forces across Europe agree in their opposition to Brussels, but disagree over their next course of action. There is no accord as to what the main objective of a populist nationalist EU parliament is, or who should lead it. So, as the European parliament falls into the hands of populists, the parliament may end up deeply fragmented and ineffective. Next question by Andreas. What latent conflict is the most likely to receive international attention? When reporting the news, 
media outlets focus on three factors. Time, distance, and affinity. For example, if you're from Houston, Texas, you're probably more interested in events in Australia as opposed to Indonesia, even though the distance is more or less the same. The reason for this is that Australia is more compatible with the American identity, so it raises more sympathies and interests, which is good for media business. The only thing even more interesting than Australia is something even closer to home, let's say New Orleans. So media business is based on supply and demand. And since most latent conflicts are in Africa, these are unlikely to ever receive significant media attention. The events in Venezuela and Ukraine are more relatable than in Yemen and Afghanistan, and the conflicts in Afghanistan and Yemen are more relatable than the crisis in, let's say, Ethiopia, Somalia, the Sahel countries, etc. So this is a bit of a paradox, because the latent conflicts in Africa are unlikely to receive any meaningful media attention. Going back to the question, the most striking conflicts in Africa at the moment concern the French military operations in the Sahel, the fragile peace in South Sudan, the activity of Boko Haram in Nigeria and Lake Chad region, the uneasiness in Sudan and the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon. The final conflict, Cameroon, is perhaps the most risky area because it could go either way, peace or war. We actually did a video on the origins of the Cameroon conflict. Check it out if you have the time. Next question by Eric. With the ejection of Mr. Zuma and the reconstructing of the ANC in South Africa, is it possible for the country to return to it decisively leading Africa in the coming decades or have will countries like Nigeria surpassed it? South Africa is a heavyweight power in the southern half of Africa. Nigeria's influence, however, is confined to West Africa, while Ethiopia, also a major power, is focused in East Africa. The interests of these three African powers rarely ever cross paths, let alone compete for influence. So, in spite of the difficulties within the ANC, South Africa never lost its geopolitical footing. Perhaps the single greatest geographic advantage that South Africa enjoys from much of the rest of the continent is that its main territory occupies a malaria-free climate, which makes South Africa well suited for agricultural ventures. And this sets the country apart from the rest of the continent. There are only a handful of African countries that can claim the same. Adding to the fortune of South Africa are the mineral resources located at its northern and central interior, from coal, platinum, diamonds to gold, silver and zinc. South Africa enjoys an abundance of resources. However, the uneven spread of these mineral resources generates economic disparity. Political unity, therefore, within the ANC is necessary for the state to address issues like mass unemployment, corruption, economic disparity, etc. I think the ANC's next big challenge are the pro-business reforms. Labour unions in the country are quite powerful and will oppose the labour laws and privatisation changes. The massive internal problems at ESCOM, which is the country's power provider, also weakens the national GDP. So the current government is walking a thin line between pro-business lobbies and populist forces. Now if those reforms fail, the blowback could open the door for even more populist forces to enter the mainstream. The following question by Pete. What is the position of the new Ukrainian president on relations with Russia beyond the political rhetoric? What is his stance? Zelensky inherited the same hopeless dynamics shaping the conflict as existed during Poroshenko's presidency. The narrative of lawmakers in Kiev and Moscow has toned down. There is speculation in Kiev that the new president might strike a deal with Russia where Ukraine capitulates Crimea and Donbass. However, the positive rhetoric does not match the actions on the ground. Behind the public screen, Ukrainian and Russian policymakers are continuously looking for non-military ways to undermine one another. 
Recently, for instance, Russia banned the export of petroleum products and crude oil to Ukraine and Putin signed a decree that speeds up the process for Ukrainians to obtain Russian citizenship. This is a curious detail in the crisis because by increasing the number of Russian citizens in the Donbas area, Russia is creating the legal pretext for an invasion. It should be noted that Russian law allows the use of its armed forces to protect Russian citizens beyond Russian borders. We saw the application of this law during the Georgian war. Zelensky responded in kind by making a counteroffer on obtaining Ukrainian citizenship, but the situation is beyond his control. So, despite the optimistic attitudes, Russia is by no means finished with Ukraine. Putin's ultimate goal is the federalization of Ukraine, thereby granting each region veto rights over foreign, economic and cultural policies. And given Zelensky's lack of political experience, Putin will test him with offers, aggression and everything in between to measure his resolve. It will be a stick and carrot policy. Meanwhile, Zelensky will keep Ukraine on the western path. He is bound by the constitution to seek for EU and NATO membership. So both parties have retained their red lines and their respective policymakers are working within the current frameworks. A peace deal therefore is unlikely with or without Zelensky. Stephen, the next question, wants to know, do you think there is any validity to Peter Zihain's theory that Alberta may become independent from Canada due to disagreements over Alberta's oil? He even suggests they may join the USA so they can sell their oil much more easily. Yeah, I remember this chapter as well. It was quite memorable. We all know Canada as this enormous state, but when seen through the lens of the human footprint, the country is reduced to a narrow strip by the US border. Moreover, Canada is split in east and west. Separating the two communities is a 600 km stretch of land that is sparsely populated. While East Canada is more densely populated, Alberta in the west is the widest populated region. Human activity and habitation is more evenly spread there. Peter Zihain in The Accidental Superpower says that the western parts of Canada have more in common with specific parts of the USA. For instance, Alberta has more in common with Texas, with the oil industry and all. This narrative is true, but it is viewed strictly from an economic lens. Now, Alberta has been treated unfairly in Canada. It is the only province that is a net contributor to the national budget. It gives more than it gets back. Earlier this year, in February, a poll by Angus Reid Institute found that 50% of Albertans would support secession from Canada. Now, these polls are rarely ever accurate and therefore do not reflect the situation on the ground, but the narrative is real. Since 2010, Albertan separatism has increased significantly. So, Zihain's suggestion that Alberta may become independent or join the USA has merit to it. On the other hand, it should be noted that Canada's geopolitical divisions have existed since the country's formation, and yet the state of Canada exists and has maintained its territorial integrity. Much of the credit goes to Canadian policymakers who have always acknowledged the country's internal vulnerabilities and made compromises for the sake of political unity. For a long time, Quebec wanted to separate from the country. What the government did was accommodate Quebec's needs with all kinds of special treatments. As a result, most people in Quebec largely abandoned the idea of separatism. So, a special agreement with Alberta is more likely than secessionism or joining the USA. Next question by no name 551 What USA gained from the Afghan and Iraqi wars? What was the real objective there? And was the effort justified at the end? To understand the purpose of the US wars in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the Middle East, we must actually rephrase this question to what Al-Qaeda sought to gain by the 9-11 attacks. Because nearly everything the United States did was in retaliation. Al-Qaeda's motive 
and geopolitical pursuits is rarely ever discussed in mainstream panels, but it comes down to the following. The group assaulted the United States at its heart to discredit the all-powerful American government in the eyes of the international community. Al-Qaeda wanted to give the impression that Washington was vulnerable and weak. Originally, Al-Qaeda didn't believe that the US would invade Afghanistan in the winter season, which would have been a nightmare for logistics. So Al-Qaeda's plan was to attack America and launch a propaganda war in the Muslim world while the United States remained inactive and without response until next spring. That's six months. This plan obviously fell apart the moment the Russians got aboard the American plan, but had this not happened and the United States didn't respond in Afghanistan with force, then the governments of Muslim-majority nations would have also been discredited for befriending the feeble USA. Al-Qaeda's ultimate goal was to discredit the United States and the Muslim governments and thereby plant the seeds of massive public unrest, which would later on result in the overthrow of the governments of Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc. The aim was to revive the Khalifat. Looking at the Middle East today, the flame of chaos is exactly what Al-Qaeda sought to achieve, for only in such conflicts can extremist forces rise. Of course, in the very little time we have, I'm skipping over the major details, but I hope this synopsis is clear. As for Iraq, again, also very little coverage regarding the covert war that was going on. Basically, the Bush administration invaded Iraq on the intelligence provided by Ahmed Chalabi, who had very close ties to the top officials in the White House and the Pentagon. The Bush administration had numerous reasons to invade Iraq, be it resources, geopolitics or the petrodollar, but it was Chalabi who provided the single most instrumental source of Iraqi intelligence for the US government. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld wasn't lying about Saddam's nuclear bombs, he just didn't know any better. Later. After the invasion of Iraq, it turned out Chalabi not only provided the US government with extremely faulty intelligence, but he had close ties to the Iranian intelligence apparatus. So either the American spy Chalabi provided for faulty intelligence, or he was a double agent working for the Iranians. We will obviously never learn the real truth. But looking at the context of things, I believe the Americans were duped by the Iranians to invade Iraq. It just so happens that Iran also emerged as the biggest winner in the post-Saddam world. My apologies for rambling on like this, but I had to get this out of my chest. Next question by Kevin. Can the IMF and the World Bank simply be considered tools for US foreign policy or interests? If such is the case, will China seek to supplant US control of these institutions, form parallel institutions or supplementary institutions? The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have complementary missions. They were established when the Allied nations devised a reconstruction plan for Europe and the world in general, along with eight other international institutions very similar these formed the Bretton Woods system. For the next four decades, these institutions largely drove international development and enabled the dollar to serve as the global reserve. So when looking through this lens, the IMF and the World Bank certainly helped foster the geopolitical world order we know today, but it's not like the Americans can directly stare everyone else to do their bidding. The legal systems of both institutions enjoy a healthy degree of autonomy, and sometimes they even come in conflict with the interests of the US government. That said, both institutions are subject to US influence. For instance, the top management of both institutions spent much more time consulting with American lawmakers than with any other member state. 
This means that Washington is the largest shareholder and the most influential member state of the IMF and the World Bank. And whenever the US considers something of crucial importance, it has ways to impose its will. American policymakers also consider both institutions as instruments of foreign policy to be used for US objectives. And American lawmakers often express impatience with the process of consensus building in the IMF and the World Bank. In many ways, America's relationship with the Bretton Woods institutions is comparable to Germany's relationship with the European Union. Yes, it's powerful, but influence does not equal ownership. Thus, even though Washington cannot steer the policy of these institutions with impunity, the sheer influence the US has is enough for many states to deem the IMF and World Bank as an American instrument. The European Union, Japan, China have their own parallel institutions. China, for instance, has set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is smaller but legally identical to the International Monetary Fund. Next question. Contenders wants to know, what is Israel's endgame in the Middle East after annexing the Golan Heights and Jerusalem? Will they keep annexing? Yeah, I can understand where this question is coming from. The end game of any nation is survival. Sometimes, actually often, that comes at the expense of others. In Israel's case, the expansion of its borders are due to strategic needs. The country's heartland is situated by the coastline running from Tel Aviv to the north. The patch of land is little over 15 kilometers wide, counting from the coast to the border of the West Bank. That is remarkably condensed, not to mention vulnerable. And no amount of military technology can effectively defend such a condensed terrain. At least, not on such a short distance. This is why Israel can never accept the independence of Palestine, or even let go of the West Bank as it did with the Gaza Strip. Thus, the reason for the Israeli occupation of Palestine is not for moral, historical, or even legal reasons, but for geopolitical designs. Sooner or later, Israel will annex the West Bank. To the south, occupying the Sinai Peninsula offers no strategic advantage, quite the opposite. Logistics is a nightmare in the Sinai, and whoever controls it will place its armed forces at a disadvantage. West of the Jordan River, the Israelis have no goals either, but to the north are two targets with strategic value. By the Syrian border between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee, there is an opening of about 40 kilometers wide. A large, well-equipped army can invade Israel from this plain. Fun fact, this area is historically known as Medigo or Armageddon, which affirms it as the soft spot of Israel. And therefore, from the standpoint of Israeli policymakers, it was necessary to conquer and annex it. The final area that may be annexed in the future is by the border with Lebanon. From a strictly geographic angle, the best line for Israel's defense is the Litani River, which is some 40 kilometers within the borders of southern Lebanon. However, the Lebanese have thus far not given the Israelis any reason to occupy that space. So in the coming years, we will see the formal annexation of the West Bank in addition to the Golan Heights and Jerusalem. And if a real conflict breaks out with Lebanon, Israel may decide to occupy the land up to the Litani River as well. Beyond these parameters, Israeli policymakers have never shown any real interest. So the concept that Israel wants to expand from the Sinai in Egypt to the Euphrates in Iraq is unfounded. Israel does not have the capacity or the demography to hold such a vast space. Israel's borders will therefore not expand beyond the current de facto situation. And that's a wrap for this Q&A. Thank you so much for these interesting, wonderful questions. If you want to partake in the next round of the Q&A, you can do so by joining our Patreon community. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. Anyway, thank you for your time. Take care and savo.